My name is uh, Trevor Davis. I'm the relatively new Associate VP Scholarship and Community Engagement here at VIU, and I'm here to welcome you and introduce the introducer for Marshall Souls. Um, first and foremost, I want to acknowledge our presence here on traditional Sinemo First Nations territory, and on behalf of the colloquium organizers, thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay, and his staff for their support of the series, and also like to thank the theater for hosting us and providing the technical support and the Media Research Lab for filming, taping, recording, whatever we want to call it now, the event, and turning out that beautiful set of DVDs that archive our speakers forever, or at least until DVDs become obsolete. Now, my job here at VIU is uh, it's an interesting position discipline-wise. Um, I've got a background as a faculty member, but part of my work is to support all faculty in all disciplines as they look for grant funding try to get projects underway, or build supports to help them and their students connect with the community around us. And I thought I might focus this little welcome talking about community engagement. It's my job, I punched the clock this morning and I am on company time, but I don't really think I need to. Um, it's something I might talk about elsewhere, but I think here I'm standing in the middle of one of the best examples of the university engaging with the community that I can think of. So I thought as a complete departure for me, I might actually talk about the topic that was suggested by the organizers, which was the importance of the arts and humanities. And it seems pretty obvious to me, and perhaps to you, or you wouldn't really be sitting out there in those chairs, but sometimes you run into people that think that their discipline, physics for example, is the pinnacle of all knowledge. And rather than hit them up the side of the head with the weighty history text that you're leafing through at the moment, it's really helpful to have a rebuttal for that. So specifically what I want to talk about is the divide between the disciplines. Now in my position I get to watch all the disciplines at once and not quite from the outside. And I've always found it a bit curious. In the multidisciplinary readings that I often do, I ran across some writings by Pigliucci, and that's not the opera or the Seattle pizza chain or the restaurant in Victoria, but Pigliucci is a philosopher from the City University in New York. And he reminded me of a couple of concepts that uh, were important to me in some of the graduate courses that I took long ago. So in, in 1959, um, C.P. Snow published an essay called The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution. And it's all about the divide between the natural and physical sciences and the humanities, with social sciences sort of stuck somewhere in the middle. Now he had the experience of moving from the natural sciences into the humanities. And he found quite a bit of hostility towards his old area. And he actually got in the habit of responding to this by asking his colleagues to quote the second law of thermodynamics, which I'm sure you can imagine how popular that was in the history department. Even though this was basically the same as him back in his old uh, departments asking his science colleagues if they'd read any of the works of Shakespeare. And things have just become, I think, even more entrenched between the disciplines in the, last, in the following 50 years. These days, the idea of being interdisciplinary usually means collaborating within the sciences or within the humanities, not necessarily between them. To collaborate between them, you basically have to be transdisciplinary. And that isn't necessarily the best career move for an academic. In my part of the academic uh, research world, there are separate granting councils for those two different groups. And that furthers the concept of the two as really separate realities in the academic environment. They compete with each other for attention. The only advantage to having them separate like that is when one goes for funding relative to the other, it's a very public thing to do, and so it's not politically acceptable to fund one and not the other. The only real way, or one way of approaching this divide is to try and nest the disciplines. And the way the nesting goes depends which discipline you're in. So a good example, and one of my favorites, is the angle taken by um, writers like E.O. Wilson, who tried the whole reductionist approach. So that was the argument that all human experience could be understood by resort to the natural sciences. So he thought society, art, ethics, religion could be explained by improving our understanding of evolutionary heritage. So for example, literature would be understood first in terms of the social sciences, like sociology and psychology, then more mechanistically by the biological sciences, like neurobiology or evolutionary biology, and finally being reduced, of course, to physics. 
Now, this, is, this type of reductionism is quite popular in some disciplines. Physicists like it, as do some philosophers. So why is it so appealing? Well, one big reason is the concept of the unified theory of everything, a single way to understand all human knowledge. And the idea has quite an appeal. Back to physics again, there's a drive towards simplicity and elegance in your explanations. So for example, why should there be 57 different types of fundamental fields? It's a lot more elegant to have a string theory that wraps it all up into one. Einstein even spent the last 30 years of his life seeking a unified theory. And he had a lot to say about elegance. He couldn't accept quantum mechanics because it didn't fit the traditional view of simplicity in explanation. But I think that's even a bit ironic. Simplicity and elegance aren't empirical concepts. They aren't something you can really measure. They're philosophical judgments. So where am I going with this? As I said, I'm not up here to slag physics, although I've done it a few times, or even reductionism. It's done some amazing things. But human culture is something that we need disciplines in both of these camps to properly explain. So take painting, for example. It may be that science can help explain why humans started painting on cave walls, maybe using discoveries in evolutionary biology or cognitive science, or why we like to draw symmetrical figures. But that type of explanation massively undermines the variety of ways that humans do visual art. It doesn't explain Picasso. And it's the same with math. Quite likely, simple math had some sort of evolutionary advantage way back when. It came about due to natural selection. But how do you get from that to Andrew Weil solving Fermat's last theorem? So in these cases, biology sets the background conditions for the feats, but has little to say about where we've ended up today. Wilson really thought that the boundaries between academic disciplines were just accidents of history, and they should be eliminated. But others, like Noam Chomsky, have surmised that perhaps the academic disciplines aren't a historical accident or created through the whim of academic administrators. Maybe they reflect the natural way that human beings understand the world and their role in it. Maybe there is out there some perfect way of understanding knowledge in some sort of absolute sense, but what we've come up with is something that really works for us. The disciplines in the arts and the humanities aren't fields that go beyond science. In fact, you might say they come before it. There's culture, history, human emotions expressed by literature, music, and art, and out of that grew the sciences. I think the best way to understand the world that we inhabit as human beings isn't going to come from reduction or division, but from a continual dialogue between the disciplines. And I think that really at its core is what makes a university work. Now before I ask Steve Lane to introduce the speaker, I just want to say a few words about the topic that you're going to hear about today, because before I headed down this academic career path, I had another life, and I worked in the media, mainly in film. And I say that with some trepidation because at uh, many, in the university situation, mentioning that is like um, sitting down to dinner and just happening to mention that you used to be a cannibal. In the early 80s, I was training for that career at Ryerson. And in my second year, there was an English elective. And there was a new prof who didn't have much experience with the, the type of students she was going to be teaching. And she focused specifically on demonstrating the bias and the propaganda that was built into news coverage of all sorts. And at that point, I was really seriously thinking about heading down the whole video journalism path. And it was a complete light bulb moment for me. And not just because of the revelations about that, but also because I saw the majority of the people in my class really refused to accept what I thought were very evident facts. And I realized that a big part of the problem was that the people creating the media, they weren't stupid, but they were enmeshed in a belief system about what they were doing that they were unwilling to let go. And that prof honestly completely changed the course of my life. She also made it so I could really never watch television again without a little voice in my ear saying, you're looking at a story, not necessarily the facts. So you can imagine how much fun it is watching the news with me. But now I'm pleased to ask Dr. Steve Lane, a longtime member of the English and Media Studies Departments, former Dean of Arts and the Humanities, and now Associate VP, Academic, and Academic Planning and Aboriginal Initiatives, to introduce our speaker. Thanks very much, Trevor, for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
I also want to recognize that we're on the traditional territory of the Snanamuk people, and we've got a long and productive relationship with our local First Nation. Today, I have been asked to introduce our speaker, and it's both a pleasure and a privilege to do so. As I sifted back through memories trying to prepare for this task, I was overwhelmed because there was much too much to really do justice to a proper introduction. It was turning into, well, probably a colloquium presentation of its own. So I'm just going to try to boil this down to a few uh, highlights or selections so that we can get Marshall up here to talk to you. Dr. Marshall Souls joined what was then Malaspina College in 1987 as a non-regular instructor of English. So we were a two-year institution at the time. I had just secured a regular position, having spent five years also as a non-regular instructor. So our careers here have overlapped from 1987, at least until his retirement in 2009, and then on occasion uh, beyond. My impressions of Marshall, and I have to call him Marshall. I know a lot of his close friends call him Marsh, but to me, he's always Marshall. So that's just the way it is. I can't shorten it. <clears throat> My impressions of Marshall solidified during our time as colleagues into a long list of positive attributes. Marshall was very student focused. Marshall was committed to critical thinking and writing as core competencies of the liberal arts, no matter what kind of course he was teaching. Marshall was very hard working. I, you know, he was one of those persons who you just always saw in his office or in the media lab or wherever. Marshall was critical of government and corporate agendas, but I think in his life on campus and in his professional life, he also remained quite practical and pragmatic. And so he was one of those people who tried to find ways to actually make things better. Marshall was creative, pursuing a number of artistic avenues. The things that I remember are his photography and his music. And I think another one of the features that I really appreciated as a colleague was that Marshall remained active with his scholarship, no matter what form that took, no matter what discipline, no matter what kind of project. So for me, Marshall Souls uh, is almost like a prototype of the kind of faculty colleague that uh, populates the so-called teaching universities. He's sort of the best of this type of institution. As colleagues in the English department, we shared a few interests, and over time, this led to good collaboration in media studies. For several years, Marshall and I were the only ones teaching a limited number of lower level courses. They were elective courses. They were a lot of fun to teach. I think they were a lot of fun for the students. But it was Marshall's vision and hard work and tenacity through a number of years that collected those courses into a program. First, a BA minor, and then later, a major within the Bachelor of Arts degree. Marshall Souls truly built the Media Studies program, and I think many of my, our colleagues here in the audience would agree with that. It was very satisfying, I have to say, when the BA major was being scrutinized here by a three-person ministry-appointed review panel, uh, kind of an accreditation process, and the two of us were sitting there, Marshall as the chair of the program and the proponent of the, of the proposal, and I by that time as the dean. So we felt our chances were pretty good by then. Of course, for Marshall, retirement from his faculty position in 2009 simply meant time to devote to his long list of other projects. As some of you know, he had to fight lymphoma shortly after his retirement, but he seems to have emerged as creative and energetic as ever. Some of you will have seen him back on campus since then as part of a couple of mixed media pr presentations and collaborations. And he's been traveling to places like the Amazon, the Galapagos Islands, the Himalayas, I'm not sure if that's Marshall's bucket list, but it sure sounded like the bucket list many of us would uh, carry around. So today's session is a presentation in advance of the release of his new book, Media, Persuasion, and Propaganda. I know this is an area of interest for Marshall and has been for a long, long time. We have a course called Media Studies 205 that's been on the books for many, many years that has a very similar title. And uh, so this is something that he's probably devoted much of his career to thinking about. And uh, today, the book comes out, I think, next month in the UK. And so today's presentation is in advance of that uh, release. And I would, without further ado, like to give you our, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Marshall Souls. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, it's great to be back. Uh, thanks for the uh, really warm introductions. Uh, perfect setup for what I hope to talk about. And I want to add to the thanks to the Shnenamu people. Um, this is a really amazing example of cooperation and generosity to be able to uh, have these kinds of events on traditional Shinamu territory in Ochika. Um, two years after I retired in 2009, I had some serious health issues. Steve alluded to that. Uh, but I learned something really important about persuasion during that episode. People wanted to help me and recommended that I look into a treatment they had heard about or eat certain foods or nutritional supplements. My Cuban friend Ramiro invited me to come to Cuba to take blue scorpion venom. In particular, nutritional tips contradicted advice I was receiving from doctors, though I didn't ask them about the blue scorpion stuff. It was difficult to know what to do since this advice from my friends was given with love, with no other intention than to be helpful, and I often felt I was caught in a kind of loving contradiction. Eventually, I took the advice of a doctor friend who advised me to take a number, stand in line, and do what they tell you, and don't go on the internet. You'll just get confused. Happily, that advice worked out for me. And I learned something about influence and persuasion, the subject of my talk today. Uh, we are bombarded by messages every day trying to influence us, and many of those messages are well-intended, even loving. My subject is not all about conspiracy and manipulation. I'm sure some of you will be disappointed, so don't stream too fast out the doors. Um, persuasion can have a playful, upbeat side to it. While advertising and public relations can be supremely annoying, they can also be optimistic and celebratory. So I'm not about to tell you that persuasion and propaganda are universally bad. Quite the contrary. I'd like to suggest how persuasion and propaganda are certainly about power and control, but also about learning and change. Persuasion and propaganda, as the title uh, warns us here, uh, are both simple and complicated. Simple because they attempt to influence. End of story. In the opening slide here, a young Cuban woman is reading a book pursuing her education. On the wall behind her, Government propaganda calls for a revolution in every neighborhood. In the background, the building in the Spanish style reminds us that Cubans continue their struggle against colonization. We see at least three layers of persuasion, but still pretty simple to grasp. Book, wall, building. The image also illustrates why the historian Harold Laswell called propaganda the symbolic instrument. Propaganda communicates its m meaning through symbols, books, flags, barred windows, which we learn to read. The image also illustrates, oh, I already read that. But persuasion is also complicated because the motivation to influence ranges from love to hate from gift-giving to self-interest, from life-saving to life-destroying, and we don't always know how it will turn out. As we will see, persuasion trades on uncertainty. We are presented with a decision to make, whether to buy something or pursue a career. Persuasion involves trust, since possible deception may be at play. We take a risk and make our bet. There is a power imbalance in this game. See the one bird's quite a bit larger than the other and probably has a better hand. But persuasion is also complicated because the, uh, I'll be including images from my collection of street art as examples of a medium routinely criticized as vandalism when the best of the genre can be brilliant, satirical, and newsworthy. There's a class war going on and it's being written on the city's walls. In the early 90s, working class Britons hated Thatcher's poll tax and wanted to speak their own truth to government. Their media were the walls and streets of Manchester. 
So that was one of the, was one of the first images I took in a series that I called Urban Wallpaper. Not made up. It, none of this was photoshopped, folks. It's all uh, record shots of uh, street art. I want to leave lots, lots of time at the end for you to ask questions and contribute examples. I hope I can get through this with it, to leave enough time. Specifically, though, I wanted to ask you about persuasion and propaganda in your own discipline. What you are studying or what you are teaching, what you are passionate about. How is your field of interest shaped by persuasive arguments and propaganda? Where do you see blind spots, prejudices, stereotypes, controversies, ideology, or taboos? I'd like some of you to share these insights with the audience later on. My hope is that we can leave here today with some ideas about the importance of persuasion and propaganda across the disciplines, something that Trevor just spoke to, as a way to explore ideas that unify us as a tribe of learners. So one of my, one of my arguments is, is that persuasion and propaganda provide a thread across discipline. They're as equally interesting in business and psychology as they are in the graphic arts or literature. And it's the, it's the study of persuasion that can provide channels back and forth between the different disciplines. And it can be all handled within individual departments. Um, I'm passionate about learning and still rankle at division and hierarchy in higher education. So keeping it simple, let me start with the title, Media, Persuasion, and Propaganda. This is the title of a book I recently finished for Edinburgh University Press. Uh, people mentioned it's coming out in February. Uh, persuasion and propaganda uh, require media to have their impact. So if you're talking about persuasion or propaganda, you, you have to talk about the medium because the medium will change the message. Uh, the slide here shows the satirical idea that the commercial media want our attention so they can show us things in their best interest. Uh, that their best interest is important. Mass media make profits by delivering eyeballs to advertisers. Juxtaposed to that image is a glimpse of a mass demonstration pushing back at mass media. There are two mass mediums here in a feedback loop that illustrates the traffic in persuasion. This is a pretty simple uh, communications model. Uh, it can look really messy, but I've sort of given the bare bones structure. Um, in this is the communications environment. Uh, you start with the sender encoding a message to salute the deliver to suit the delivery medium, uh, hoping that noise won't derail the message. The audience receives the message, decodes it, makes some decisions, and either moves on or sends feedback. The receiver does not have to accept the message and can reject it outright or ask questions about it. The feedback loop is essential for dialogue to occur. Both the original message and the feedback are equally subject to interference caused by noise, and it's important that the message is crafted for the medium of transmission. So the noise, if uh, the sender sends the message, noise can be anything from line noise, static in the line, uh, to interference of different kinds, like interruptions, uh, commercial breaks, uh, people in the same room as you, all kinds of different things uh, can interfere with the uh, transmission of the signal. And the receiver, if using a feedback loop of some kind, has the same kinds of problems uh, of possible interference that can be there uh, and does the message get through. Uh, the, the principle that the, the medium shapes the message is pretty easy to illustrate. This talk that I'm giving, for example, is very different than the book I wrote. I'm, I've written this so hopefully it sounds better if I read it in a, a public setting. Um, if you uh, want to have a difficult conversation with your employer, how do you communicate? So this is a question for you. How would you do it? Got a problem with my boss. 
what's the best way to get my message across? Do you prefer email, telephone, or face-to-face -face interaction? I'm an email guy. I like to use email because I can think about what I'm saying. Uh, my wife Donna, if she has a choice, she always uses the telephone. Some people like face-to-face. -face. But the, the point here is that depending on which one you choose, you're going to choose your words differently and you're going to choose your sentence constructions, the level of formality, all those things are going to be affected by the choice you make. Depending on your choice, you present your message with what I call protocols, appropriate guidelines and conventions suitable to the medium. There's a huge body of research, for example, on the changes of storytelling resulting from the introduction of writing into oral cultures. We tell our stories differently in writing than orally. A novel tells its story differently than a film or stage play. A TED talk is different than the book on which it is based. In our generation, much thinking and research has gone into the best way to tell stories using social media. And it's probably where some of you are expert. Um, Twitter's 140 character limit uh, requires few words, many shortcuts, and iconic imagery. So that stands out in that uh, crowded message environment. The hashtag has become a familiar protocol. Feedback is easy with Twitter. Media ecology is an approach to media studies that focuses on the impact of media on culture. In the case of Twitter or Facebook, a media ecologist wants to know how the new medium changes things, how people use it, how the medium affects consciousness, and what impact it will have on culture. There are cultural critics, they are cultural critics who look for connections. For example, how are Twitter or YouTube having an impact on newsmaking, marketing, or political campaigning? Let's see if I can get this guy to work. Citizens of the world, this is important, the time is serious. On January 7, 2015, freedom of speech was bruised. Terrorists breached into Charlie Hebdo headquarters and shot several cartoon artists, journalists and two policemen. Disgusted and shocked, we can't fall down. It is our responsibility to react. We are all affected by the death of Kabu, Charb, Tignus and Walensky, talented artists who were murdered for their opinions and the freedom of their newspaper. Charlie Hebdo, historical figure of satirical journalism has been targeted by cowards. Anonymous has always fought for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. We will never stop. Anonymous reminds every citizen that freedom of the press is fundamental to all democracy. It is everyone's responsibility to defend it. We always fought for freedom of speech. We will not give in. Attacking freedom of speech is attacking anonymous. We will not permit it. Any organizations and enterprises linked to those terrorist attacks should expect a massive reaction from anonymous. We are tracking you down. We will find you and not leave you any rest.
See how many, um, 1 million, uh, 105,000 views uh, since uh, January 15th, I think when it was posted. So this message from Anonymous, whoever they are, uh, is topical. Uh, it expresses an opinion really strongly. And uh, a lot of people are seeing it. So this is my, uh, my submission for uh, taking a look at new media like YouTube as a way of getting the news out there. And uh, a clip like this becomes news. It's covered in The Guardian and it's covered in uh, The Globe and Mail uh, as being newsworthy. And um, it shows the power of the medium. And it works because it's a beautifully crafted little film that works on YouTube. It's iconic, it's, it, the language is clear, and it's punchy, it's got great you know, music, and gets you all stirred up if you're inclined that way. In uh, this YouTube video, the hacker collective known as Anonymous is joining the fierce global debate about Charlie Hebdo and media censor censorship. What kind of impact does this video have in a communications environment dominated by major players, including governments? So we, we don't really know the answer to that. That's a, that's a research question. From January 10th to the 21st, this video was viewed over one million times and received considerable coverage in corporate news. In the 1950s and early 1960s, and it's, uh, it's been introduced into a very complicated media environment. It's crowded out there. In the 50s and early 60s, media ecologist Marshall McLuhan worried that magazines, television, radio, and film were saturating the mental environment with a proliferation of persuasive messages that threatened to drown out serious discourse. So does this anonymous video do that, do you think? While the potential for television to educate the masses was huge in the 50s, it soon became apparent that the deluge of persuasion was mind-boggling. McLuhan borrowed the analogy of the maelstrom or whirlpool from Edgar Allan Poe's short story, Descent into the Maelstrom, to convey this feeling of being pulled under by powerful forces. I don't know if you can see the, the hapless sailor. He's in the, uh, towards the bottom of the image. He's been pulled, this ship's been pulled into the maelstrom. He's abandoned ship and he's grabbed hold of uh, a floating barrel, it looks like. McLuhan explains how Poe's sailor saves himself by observing that heavier objects sink faster in the maelstrom than lighter objects, so he abandons his ship and grabs onto some buoyant flotsam that eventually carries him to the surface. In Rackham's drawing, the sailor is clinging to a trunk. By analogy, McLuhan implies that we can survive the media maelstrom by abandoning our heavy, outmoded ideas and adopting new ways of understanding media. So he wrote this book, famous book, Understanding Media in the early 60s. And he went medium by medium to show how it could be used effectively. Still a good read. This idea that our mental environment is oversaturated with persuasive messages was famously expressed by journalist and publicist Walter Lippmann in his 1922 public opinion. I want to just emphasize the date there, 1922, right after the First World War. Uh, Lippmann was making the same observations that McLuhan was in the 50s. And they're both making the same observations that we hear repeated over and over again in 2015. This deluge of information required stereotypes. That's, uh, Lippmann's the originator of that term, stereotypes in this particular use, as shortcuts to decision making. And a quote from him, in the great blooming buzzing confusion of the outer world, Lippmann wrote, we pick out what our culture has already defined for us and we tend to perceive that which we have picked out in the form stereotyped for us by our culture. As a photographer, I experienced this when I traveled to a new country, look at the postcards on the racks 
and see that my own fresh observations are already cliches and stereotypes. It's really hard to get around them. More recently, Terry O'Reilly and Mike Tennant echo this concern when they write, we live in an age of persuasion where people's wants, wishes, whims, pleas, brands, offers, enticements, truths, petitions, and propaganda swirl in a ceaseless, growing, multimedia firestorm of sales messages. I, I used to dismiss this uh, argument and uh, think, oh, well, it's, you know, just don't pay attention to it, you know? But it's not that easy. I've, I found that uh, in my research on the book, I found some very interesting material that's made me a little bit more wary because basically a lot of the stuff is saying you think you're not being influenced by it, but you don't know what's going on in your unconscious. Cognitive research since the mid-90s provides ample evidence that the brain can only process so much information at a time and in a day. It really contests the idea that we can multitask. Cognitive overload and cognitive fatigue are real impediments to understanding and make us vulnerable to making errors of judgment or to manipulation. So all the research in behavioral economics is showing that if you're cognitively overloaded or you're distracted, you'll start making errors of judgment. Uh, forced to make distinctions, uh, and decisions quickly, we take shortcuts, often relying on our stereotypes and biases as rules of thumb. When there's too much going on, we shift to selective attention mode. The classic illustration of selective attention was originally devised by Daniel Simons and Richard Chabry in 1999. I've got a, a clip here. So are you ready? It's a test. And you'll, be, you'll know if you pass the test right after it's over. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabry and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from VizCog Productions. Learn more at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like more than half the, peop half the people watching this video don't see the gorilla, even though it's on the screen for nine seconds. So we need it just illustrates that we need selective attention to accomplish the task at hand, and we also need to know that we are missing things. As media ecologists, we want to know how and when selective attention operates, because without attention, we leave ourselves vulnerable to the message, message's influence without knowing it. Uh, a book that I used as a teacher for years was uh, Robert Cialdini's uh, book called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. And he's got a very well-known model that people use, especially uh, it's been adopted by a lot of people in business. Selective attention plays an important role in the psychology of influence. Robert Cialdini uses the phrase click were to describe the automatic response to attempts at persuasion. He describes how persuaders take advantage of the click were response by using what he calls weapons of influence. So he calls them weapons. I don't know, can you read the, the writing? Um, 
and I'll, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's fascinating to study this stuff and to s apply it to your own life. It's really useful information. Uh, the ancient law of reciprocation, called reciprocity there at the top, uh, ensures that we will feel obligated to return a gift. If someone gives us a gift, we're in their debt. We just feel that we need to, and it, it, it's an ancient thing because um, that's how trust is built in a community. Uh, the next weapon is uh, we feel compelled to com keep commitments to avoid being perceived as inconsistent, even when that commitment is no longer in our interests. So if you're, if you're buying a car, for example, the car salesman will get you to fill out the uh, sales form. Once you've filled out that sales form, you're hooked because that's your commitment and you can't, it's really hard to change your mind after that. And if you amp that whole situation up, a lot of research on, on uh, brainwashing showed that if you can get the prisoners to write down their thoughts, then it's very hard for them to deny them later on because they've committed in words. It's a very powerful force. Uh, you probably all know that we defer to authority uh, even when it's not legitimate. You know, we feel our parents, our teachers, our spiritual leaders all told us how great authority was. And um, we, you know, even uh, when you get to university, you're still feeling that authority figures are important to you. Um, another big source of influence is uh, when we look around us, uh, especially uh, to peers, we're looking for social proof and confirmation of our actions. So we don't know what to do, we're uncertain. So we look around, we see what people, other people are doing and then we, we follow their lead. Uh, Cialdini uses the, the case of uh, the woman in New York, Kitty Genovese, who was uh, murdered in the street and nobody did anything. And uh, everybody, his theory was is that everybody looked around, didn't see anybody taking any action, so they thought maybe it was okay for some reason. Uh, you know, maybe it was a domestic dispute or something. So there's all kinds of examples of where people don't know what to do, so they look around and they are persuaded to do what other people are doing. And uh, a big one here is we are more le easily persuaded, persuaded by people we like and who are like us. Lots of research. People, that, when we like them, we're more, we are, get into agreement more quickly with them. And if they are uh, like us, part of our own affiliation group or however we identify ourselves, then we're more likely to agree with them. Um, and scarcity is, and, and its threat affect our perception of value. So if our freedoms are scarce, then uh, they're more valuable to us. Uh, if uh, we're collecting stamps, the more the rare stamps are more valuable. Like why? They're just they're more scarce, but they're they're worth a lot more, and people will pay a lot more. Those those comic books that uh, no one else has, lots of money uh, because of the scarcity. So imagine uh, that, for example, you love someone, and in the back of your mind, even worrying you sub subconsciously, is the fear that they might be leaving you. And then all of a sudden, their love becomes a, a much scarcer uh, a feature in your life. So that's going to that's gonna provide motivation. So what Cialdini is really saying is that these are all kind of persuasive weapons or instruments. I don't like the word weapon so much, but instruments that... Um, will move you in a certain direction. Since our response to weapons of influence are often automatic and unconscious, and thinking about how they, thinking about how, uh, they work helps us to defend ourselves in the martial arts of compliance. Cialdini's phrase, click were, anticipated research on predictable irrationality by Dan Ariely and subliminality by Leonard Mlodino. We're gonna touch on some of that later. Uh, this image, uh, I took this in the Vancouver's downtown east side in 2009, and it shows two D D DJs emerging from the background 
of improvised noise with their angelic signals. And they seem to be offering us a gift. As Nate Silver explains, separating the signal from the noise is necessary for decoding messages in a saturated media environment and is an aspect of what I call the new media literacy. So I use this, uh, this illustration here to show that you can pretty well pick out the figures of the DJs. They're emerging from a background that's totally chaotic. It's improvised, it's like many, many authors writing on the walls, things get covered over, scratched up. The background I'm taking as, a, as an image of an oversaturated uh, media environment. Lots of stuff going on, lots of layers, lots of overwriting, uh, lots of contested images, people scratching out one thing and putting another thing down. And then some artists, some people are able to break through the noise with their signals. And maybe it's an art form, but maybe it's a science. But I think you can learn something about breaking through the noise from all those disciplines. As we saw earlier, propaganda and persuasion are about the future. A promise is made and we take a risk when we accept that promise. There is a gap of uncertainty that persuasion attempts to fill. Think of our ancestors sitting around the fire and wondering out loud where the first people came from. It's a mystery. And then someone tells a story that explains the mystery of human origins. Voila, a myth is created to answer one of life's mysteries. As myth gains followers, religions are born. Haida Gwaii artist Bill Reed beautifully portrays how the trickster raven opened a shell to free the first peoples from their confinement. Then the trouble began. Many commentators on persuasion, and especially advertising, draw comparisons between the promises of religion and the promises of advertising, as if advertising is the new church. So this slide shows the, uh, the building that, uh, Pope, uh, that houses the uh, department, the Roman Catholic Church department, really, or agency, if you like, for the propagation of the faith. And this is where our word propaganda comes from, is uh, from the word uh, propagation of beliefs. In 1622, Pope Gregory XV first formalized the notion of propaganda by creating a special bureaucracy to propagate the teachings of the Catholic Church both in Europe and the New World. Persuasion and propaganda. Uh, I, I put these two images together because they kind of form a, um, a, a contrast uh, between uh, Bill Reed's Bill Reed's uh, tale uh, that is really kind of propaganda. It's the propagation of the faith in the, for the First Nations to have this myth that uh, is part of their culture. And it's one way of expressing uh, that faith. And this is the Roman Catholic version of expressing that faith. It's a, it's a bureaucracy, really. And um, so propaganda ranges from anything from a myth, storytelling, and uh, tales uh, to big organizations that are consciously uh, going out and propagating the faith. You know, universities, that's their job. They're propagating the faith in higher education. That's what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, we're in a building. And the building shows that, that status that we have. So I'm going to switch a little bit here. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, be because I think that uh, persuasion and propaganda, you need to know a little bit about the roots. And it's, it's a huge subject, but I'm just going to touch on it. Um, persuasion and propaganda are built on the foundation of rhetoric. Uh, from the Greek rhetor for public speaker, rhetoric is the art of communicating effectively and persuasively. Aristotle defined rhetoric as the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. Uh, so rhetoric is opportunistic. It looks for opportunities to be persuasive. And the, the speaker needs to play on the, the situation at hand. Uh, so it's impro often improvised. 
for Aristotle, rhetoric leverages three different elements. Logos, which is appeals to logic and reasoning. Pathos, which is appeals to emotion. And ethos, which are appeals to character. So the character of the speaker is important. Do we trust this person? Are they credible? Uh, and the other thing is, does the speaker talk about things that are important to the community. So it's the community has an ethos. And if the speaker can connect with that ethos, then people will be more inclined to listen to the argument. I think this is really important uh, uh, distinction that's still worth uh, remembering. Uh, rhetoric has a history of abuse, and in our time often refers dismissively to language filled with empty promises and false sentiments. You're all so familiar with that. Ideally, however, rhetoric gives language additional impact and is judged by its effectiveness. I think this is a photo from that I took in Toronto. Uh, rhetoric exploits the ambiguity and instability of language. The fallacy of equivocation, for example, trades on ambiguity when the speaker says one thing and means another. Some people call equivocation lying. Okay. Uh, this doubleness of meaning is also a characteristic of irony. So in this one, uh, this one poster that's in the street, you know, trying to get people to think while they're walking to work, um, you got a combination both of kind of equivocation and irony together. Uh, we come to you uh, with love in our hearts for peace, but we come in tanks. That's ironic. Okay? Sam Leith captures this ambiguity when he writes, rhetoric is language at play, language plus. It, it is what persuades and cajoles, inspires and bamboozles, thrills and misdirects. Rhetoric's got two sides to it. Leith notes that Corax, whose name means crow in Latin, is credited with being the first to define the art of persuasion. Corax refined his persuasive talents in the courts, and rhetoric is often adversarial in nature. In the justice system, opponents present their arguments and a decision is made by a jury, judge, or public. Ideally, the successful argument uses credible evidence, emotional conviction, and personal character to influence the judgment. Corax, writes Leith, grasps the essential notion that in rhetoric you are dealing with likelihood rather than certainty. There is room for argument, and it is precisely in that room for argument that the art of persuasion flourishes. Uh, so there's, a, there's room for argument, and there's also a performance taking place. Think of an advocate or a lawyer in a courtroom. Persuasion and propaganda are rhetorical performances, often involving playful, creative, even devious communication filled with suspect reasoning, colorful language, and possible trickery. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is sort of a funny uh, message about being tired of men. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, playfulness, creativity, and, and uh, disguise in this image which are all part of the persuasive experience. Re rhetoric in any medium can be disguised. Literary critic uh, Kenneth Burke observes that a rhetorical motive is often present where it is not usually recognized. For example, politicians frequently identify themselves with the person in the street. Mystics identify with the source of their spiritual inspiration. That identification that they make is an argument. See, I am like that person. I took this uh, photo in uh, Kerala, India in 2012 because it, it's, uh, it, it shows the, uh, the layering up of religion and politics. Uh, that's very important in India, but it's also very important in North America too. It's like you cannot get elected to be president of the United States if you don't say, I believe in God. Uh, you'd be dead in the water. So uh, don't underestimate the power of religion there. And they borrow from one another. This image taken in Kerala suggests the complex layering of religion and politics. In both pursuits, 
I hope this doesn't sound too cynical to some of you believers out there. In both pursuits, abstract promises of salvation are offered for, offered for real world problems and needs. Burke describes how increasing abstraction and mystification can take an audience from the concrete world they are familiar with into the realm of uncertainty and speculation. Once there, anything becomes possible. As an example of mystification, economists often refer to Adam Smith's analogy of the invisible hand. Oh, it's great, it's an image and it's invisible and it's supposed to have this incredible power to shape the markets. Uh, they, uh, they use that, this image to argue that financial markets should be free to find their own equilibrium, uh, free from interference and regulation. Fidel Castro here, this is one of the, the murales in Cuba, uh, compares the moral of the revolution to the height of the stars. That's inspiring, but it's quite a stretch. I mean, what does it really mean? It's, it's an abstraction, but it's a mystification of the idea, concrete realities of, of the revolution. It's inspiring, but what exactly is it? I like Fidel. I mean, I'm not uh, criticizing him here. He's an inspiring guy. But. Persuasion exists on a spectrum of influence ranging, ranging from promotion and advocacy to propaganda, coercion, and torture. Think of a parent trying to convince a child that it's time for bed. The parent is promoting something good for the child. In advocacy and persuasion, the rhetoric becomes more calculated and the arguments are more sustained. Think of a person selling you a car or a university prof claiming that internet distractions are lowering your intelligence. Persuasion moves towards propaganda when it attempts to influence a mass audience. Communication costs increase, the stakes are higher, the, and powerful players are behind the campaign. Propaganda makes every possible attempt to control the medium and the message, and will often resort to censorship to discourage opposition, as Fidel Castro did in Cuba with dissident writers, and as the US has done with whistleblowers. In Canada, government ministers accused environmental activists of being terrorists to discourage opposition to its policies. So if you see censorship anywhere, you know that there's probably a ca propaganda campaign going on because propaganda needs censorship. It's trying to control, take total control of the information environment. And it's expensive. So it takes powerful players to, to do propaganda. It's persuasion when your friends encourage you to vote a certain way, and propaganda when a well-financed government tries to convince a whole nation that carbon-based fuels are clean or ethical or that terrorists hate our freedom. Propaganda wages total information war. Without the cooperation of mainstream corporate media, propaganda is not possible. In January, early January, two gunmen entered the Paris offices of Charlie Hebdo and killed 12 people among them the editor and cartoonist working for the satirical weekly magazine. This is not an isolated incident. In 2005, a Danish newspaper published 12 cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad to raise issues concerning criticism of Islam and self-censorship in the media. Publication of the images set off a firestorm of protest in Muslim countries and resulted in many deaths. Yale University Press refused to include the controversial images in Clausen's The Cartoons That Shook the World that was published in 2009 and defended its decision by claiming <clears throat> that they did not want to incite further protests and possible deaths. Images have power and can be turned through mockery or destruction into equally powerful examples of propaganda. The attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on 11th of September 2001 epitomize iconoclasm in the early 21st century. So iconoclasm is the destruction of icons. 
So this is what Osama bin Laden says. In an interview conducted on the 21st of October 2001, Osama bin Laden identified the iconic significance of the 9-11 targets. These young men have shifted the battle to the heart of the United States, and they have destroyed its most outstanding landmarks, its economic and military landmarks, by the grace of God. <clears throat> War is waged with both weapons and images. On the 21st of March, 2003, the U.S. launched an aerial attack on Baghdad in a campaign the U.S. military and media called Shock and Awe. As reported in the British press, the appalling Shock and Awe show resembled something that might have been conceived by a big-budget Hollywood director. The ba bombing of Baghdad a city founded in the 8th century as a center for Islamic culture was a propaganda spectacle for primetime television. Not even the satirical film Wag the Dog, in which a Hollywood producer and a publicist stage an illusory war in the media to save a presidency, anticipated shock and awe's cynical iconoclasm. <clears throat> I've always been curious about why people are unwilling to change their mistaken beliefs when they are presented with contradictory facts. But I've learned that facts do not always trump stories. In the late 1950s, Leon Festinger identified cognitive dissonance as the mental stress and discomfort experienced by people who simultaneously hold contradictory beliefs ideas or values. Those experiencing cognitive dissonance will actively try to reduce it or avoid situations likely to increase it. A research by Nyan and Riefler in 2010 found that when misinformed people, particularly political partisans, were exposed to corrected facts in news stories, they rarely changed their minds. In fact, they often became even more strongly set in their beliefs. Nyan calls this phenomenon backfire, a natural defense mechanism against cognitive dissonance. People use motivated reasoning or belief to decide which facts to accept and are unwilling to change beliefs even when confronted with evidence. Like, as a university prof, that's a, that's a serious issue. You know, you're trying to teach people to new, new things and you just don't get it why they're not getting it. You know, you just go, what's wrong with the facts? You know, aren't the facts communicating? And uh, I, used to, I used to find that a bit frustrating, but uh, doing this research, I've learned a lot about that. Um, and I've learned a lot about beliefs in relation to facts. Uh, Tabor and Lodge in 2006 discovered that politically sophisticated thinkers, and that's us, okay, that's all of us in this room, were even less open to new information than less sophisticated types. These people may be factually right about 90% of things, but their confidence makes it nearly impossible to correct the 10% on which they're totally wrong. Our cognitive defense systems protect us from deception but also shield us from new insights. Like, a, a course in this kind of uh, research should be mandatory for the university, don't you think? I mean, it's our job to be on top of things, uh, on what's going on, and to be factual about it, instead of, instead of promoting our own biases and stereotypes and our own uh, beliefs that are personally very strongly held by us, but. Uh, they're getting in the way of other people seeing things clearly. So we're, how do we keep, you know, you, you, you're in a university for years, how do you keep refreshing your, uh, your beliefs and your, the things that you know about? Uh, it it's, should be ongoing work, I think, personally. This is a shot from Toronto, and I call it the well-armed brain. Um, so 
who can blame people who, who don't want to give up their beliefs? If we change our beliefs or lose our faith, we risk being outcast from the community of believers. Our inconsistency and lack of conviction make us weak and untrustworthy in other, some people's eyes. There is a lot at stake when we are asked to give up those cherished beliefs. In a high profile example, Osama bin Laden accused the political leaders of Saudi Arabia with treachery against the global nation of Islamic peoples for cooperating and trading with the Crusader American Empire. As a consequence, he was stripped of citizenship and his assets were frozen by the Saudi government in 1994. Whistleblowers such as Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden have discovered the serious consequences of breaking the faith by revealing state secrets. Well, I see that it's, um, it's 10 after 11, and I'm about halfway through. <laughs> so I, I'm going to just talk about the ending here because I got lots of material. I already took like 50 pages of stuff and you know, boiled it down and I had no idea how long it would take. So, but I do want to, I do want to go to one place here just to summarize. I was really influenced in the middle of writing this book by the Dalai Lama's book called Beyond Religion. And in that book, he, he proposes that if we're going to have any ability to dialogue uh, across nations around the world on serious political issues, on issues of climate change, uh, what we need is uh, not stronger beliefs in our own beliefs. He says we need secular ethics. Now, secular ethics should be acceptable to all religions and even to atheists. And he builds his model of secular ethics on compassion and the golden rule. He says you find the golden rule in all the great religions, so why not use it as a model? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And the other thing he says that we need, besides compassion, because we need to empathize with other people and uh, listen to them and find out what's going on for them. And we also need discernment. And that's a word that I learned in the middle of my research that uh, really has uh, paid dividends. Because discernment describes all the tools that I would be talking about given a, a chance to speak longer um, they, uh, they help us with discernment. They help us decode the messages that we are getting. They help us to uh, distinguish between self-interested proposals that are coming our way to things that are actually in our benefit. And that's what my opening story was about. It's like people were really trying to help me. So a lot of persuasion is genuinely helpful. A lot of your profs, a lot of your parents are really trying to help with their advice. And sometimes they're trying to manipulate you and do things in their best interest. Not your profs and your parents, of course, but <laughs> possibly advertisers and, uh, you know, um, and public relations guys or government people. Um, I should show you my chart that I'm missing uh, while I'm on this subject is that uh, there's been an, a poll in the UK since 1983 that tests levels of trust in British society. And since 1983, guess which are the two least trustworthy professions according to British people? Journalists are second to the bottom with a 23% trust rating and the only people lower than them are government officials. Uh, the man in the street gets a rating of 63%. And you'll be happy to know that profs are up in the 80s. Trust really doctors, profs, scientists, and so on. So trust is a really big issue. That's where you need discernment. Can 
uh, people be trusted. And a great research by Philip Tetlock on expert political opinion. These are the pundits that you see on TV. He studied hundreds of examples, uh, 283 different pundits, uh, and he found out that, uh, these are the experts, mind you, that if he compared what they said with what actually occurred, they, were, they barely broke even. In other words, monkeys throwing darts at a target would score just about as high as these pundits. The more esteemed they were, these, these uh, pundits on TV, uh, the more likely they were to be wrong, down to about 29%, which isn't very high. So uh, the whole question of like, who do you trust? Who's got the information? It's a credibility issue. That's where the Dalai Lama's uh, idea about discernment, I find, is really, really interesting. The other, the other guy I wanted to show you is Ai Weiwei as an example of an artist who has um, gone out of his way to do great work. Just check into his career and you'll see some really amazing pieces. Um, and uh, he ended up in prison, uh, abused in prison, and he uses the internet to get his work out around the world. So he's my model for the kind of dissident artist who can really make a difference and uh, uses whatever tools he can to get his message out there. Check him out, he's, he's pretty amazing. And I, I wanted to end on this slide. Um, it's really an anti-corporate message. You know, it's like the, the, um, the, the people in the streets pushing back against corporate influence and uh, I like it. I like it because it's so dynamic and active, and uh, shows a lot of determination. And I think if we want to make changes, if we want things to be better, uh, we can't be too prejudiced about propaganda. We maybe want to use it ourselves. Uh, maybe we want to, if the government's using deception, maybe we should use deception. Maybe that's a possibility. I've been asking people lately whether we should try and change things by working inside the system or outside the system. So think of all the Arab Spring and Occupy and um, Idle No More movements. Um, they seem to be trying to push back at the system uh, to try and rectify inequalities. And are they being effective? The media ecologist approach would want to know how effective that way of communicating would be. Those civil movements are persuasive movements. They're not really propaganda uh, because they don't command, uh, they don't control the, most of the media. They get attention in the media, but there's too much, uh, 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 there's not enough support for those civil movements to be anything even approaching propaganda. So, what I wanted to finally say, um, any meaningful reform of the media or of society will have to be built on a foundation of secular ethics that does not discriminate between people with different spiritual beliefs. The creative stories of our clever and adaptive species will always play an important role in shaping the direction of our interdependent journey. We should tell our stories with compassion discernment, and as much truth as we can muster. Thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you'll share some comments and thoughts uh, in the short time that's remaining, and I'm sorry I've gone over so badly. <laughs> Thank you.